Here in Sacramento, we were so excited to see the Kings make the playoffs that them being eliminated by the Warriors might not necessarily be looked at as a failure. But I guarantee you, those within the organization, the players, the coaches, even the front office, viewed it as such. But failure only truly holds you back if you don't learn from it. And on today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast, I'm joined by NBC Sports' Christy Rodriguez. We'll talk about the failures and struggles of the Kings in that playoff series and if we're concerned or not of them carrying over into next season. It's all right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked on Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all off-season long. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer from ABC 10 News. And I've shared before one of my favorite parts about the job that I do here in Sacramento is all the amazing people that I get to meet and I get to work with. And that includes my competition, quote unquote, people that I get the uh, the privilege of seeing every single night or every day at, at Kings shoot around at, at Kings game nights and there's plenty of content to go around here in Sacramento, and that's why I encourage you so much to go out and check out all the great content in addition to Locked on Kings. Don't replace us now, but go and check out all the great content out there surrounding the Sacramento Kings. Use that to help you get through this driest part of the offseason. And some of that content should include the writings and words of Tristy Rodriguez, uh, who has only been covering the Sacramento Kings for a, a short period of time, about a season and a half for NBC Sports, but she does an excellent job, had the privilege of getting to know her more and more last season. I'm very excited to make her uh, a, a regular guest here on Locked on Kings, especially when we get into next season. If you're not familiar with Tristy, hopefully uh, this uh, interview will be a good introduction for you and make sure you keep an eye out uh, on the great work that she and Tom, who I interviewed earlier this week on Locked on Kings, the great work that they put out uh, on NBC Sports. It's it's phenomenal stuff, not just, of course, about the Sacramento Kings, also about the Niners, sometimes the Warriors, stuff like that. But really, Sacramento is Tristie's in particular. Uh, it's her beat, and I think you're going to really enjoy uh, the perspective that she provides right here on the Locked on Kings podcast. Well, if you're looking for somebody in addition to Mike Brown and the Sacramento Kings roster to give the credit for last season's success, I have a name for you. Tristy Rodriguez, digital content creator over at NBC Sports, Bay Area, California, the kind of combination of the two. It's the flagship broadcast station uh, for Sacramento Kings basketball. And Tristy spent all of last season covering the Kings, her first full season there. So thank you, Tristy, for bringing that, that good luck to uh, and getting the Kings back to the playoffs. But you were there a little bit before that, too. So you now have a season and a half, at least, plus some playoffs under your belt covering the Sacramento Kings. How are you liking it? Do you feel like you're fully ingrained in the Sacramento Kings culture? And also, welcome into the Locked on Kings podcast. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I feel like I'm a homer. Like, I don't know. I just have a thing for teams that the underdogs. So, like like you said, I started two seasons ago, and we do cover the Warriors as well. So, the Warriors have just been, you know, the dynasty and the Kings were kind of the laughing stock in our office. And I was like, no, I'm going to root for the Kings. I'm going to root for the A's with all the Giants fans. And um, yeah, so when I got the opportunity to cover the Kings, I just went, you know, full into it. And I'm, I'm a homer now. I, I, I'm basically a homer. When the uh, Kings and Warriors were matched up in the playoffs, when we knew it was going to be those two teams meeting, was that like jubilation for your office or chaos? Oh, chaos. It was, it was chaos. And it's so funny because like a few months prior, we were like, wouldn't it be so crazy if the Warriors were the sixth seed and they played the Kings in the first round and we're like, oh yeah, it's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. Like it was chaotic, but it was so much fun. There was the bets, you know, that we got to wear the Jersey if this blah, blah, blah. Um, definitely friendly, not so friendly competition, but it was fun. Was there a lot of, I imagine there was like a lot of smugness and maybe some Warriors arrogance in that office of, oh, the Warriors are going to handle this with ease and then the Kings win game one and then the Kings win game two. What was it like in the office when the Kings took a 2-0 lead? Matt, after game two, everybody was apologizing to Tom and I like, man, like you guys were right. We, you know, we didn't know this Kings team was capable of doing all this. And 
we're, we're done. It's okay. Warriors next year. Like we got to regroup. Like they were, you know how Warriors fans are. They were so over it by game two. Then after game four, they were like, all right, back to talking, you know, they're trash and rightfully so, but it, it was fun. The Warriors have added Chris Paul. A lot of people aren't sure if the Warriors have gotten better or not. Meanwhile, the Sacramento Kings have made, made very minor additions, but the belief is they will get better internally. Uh, you said you're a homer, so this might set up your answer the same way it, it set up, sets up my answer. But I just have a feeling, Tristy, you can put the regular season aside. If we got a best of seven series again between these two teams, I don't know if the Sacramento Kings are losing that series, assuming they're able to stay healthy. Yes, I agree with that. Um, I think the Warriors are just, there's a lot to be figured out with the Warriors. We don't know if Chris Paul's coming off the bench. We don't know if he's starting. We don't know what that what those rotations are going to look like. Um, same with the Kings. But I agree with you. I don't see the Kings losing that series. I personally think that they should have won this past series. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'll take the Kings in seven or six in that series. Let's do it. Let's let's run it back. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And I think some fans are rooting for that. Well, uh, there are a number of things that, that went wrong in that series. You could list off things like Kevin Herter not playing well, Harrison Barnes not playing well, De'Aaron Fox getting hurt, DeMontis Sabonis getting stomped on while also not playing well. There's a combination of different things to, that you can point to. It's like, okay, this is why the Kings ended up losing this series. And the question is, how much of that is going to carry over into next season? Because you best believe the Kings are looking at the mistakes that they made and they're going to be emphasizing those. They're already emphasizing them, I'm sure, in individual work. And then when we, when we get to training camp, when we get to preseason and early regular season, we're going to see that stuff being worked on. So, Tristy, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are some of the things that you saw in that playoff series that you're still a little bit concerned might be an issue for the Kings to, to work out? Um, I think just, I think it, it was the first playoff appearance for a lot of guys. So, um, I am a little concerned that, you know, second, it could be their second appearance next season and how will they respond? I think Kevin Herter, he's had that playoff experience prior, but he definitely did. He underperformed to, to say the least in this past past playoff series. Um, I think, Sabonis has a lot to prove. I think he was exposed. Kevon Looney exposed him um, in the series. But I, but I'm not too concerned, Matt. I think Sabonis is. He's not an old player, but he's not young or inexperienced or naive. He hears all the noise. No matter how much you and I sit in the media room and amongst others and ask him about it, and he says he doesn't care, doesn't hear it. Mm -hmm. He's he hears it. He's working on it all summer, and I think, you know, I he's mentally going to reset and also physically I feel like it's going to come back a lot a lot stronger and I think he does have a lot to prove but I don't see that happening again ever in the future with Sabonis um as far as Herder Keegan took a few games to warm up um Harrison Barnes I don't I also don't think they um will struggle the same way in the playoffs and also with um Barnes I'm not sure his role will be as big next season so maybe we bring in you know Davion into the mix more and I see guys like him who literally lives in the gym um with a lot to prove too you know after entering his third year he's working on his shot he's proven that he can bring it on the defensive end um so yeah I'm not too concerned but I do think they have um some players have a lot to prove Going back to Sabonis, what you said right there, having a lot to prove, I, I agree with you. And yes, he was absolutely outperformed by Kevon Looney. I think he'll admit as much. Anybody will admit as much. But to me, with Sabonis, it's it's while they were glaring issues and how the Warriors were able to take the Kings and Sabonis specifically out of that dribble handoff game where the Kings thrive, that was definitely concerning. But it's not like they did something or, or forced Sabonis into areas where it's perplexing and bewildering how he's going to be able to overcome it. They're leaving him open for wide open jumpers. You work on your mid range game, get a little more confidence with your mid range game. You take that away. They're forcing Sabonis to put the ball on the floor and attack the basket a little bit more. Maybe not exactly his strong suit, but he's still a bull down there. He's still capable of scoring. And people forget, like, despite the fact that he was outperformed and, and didn't play as well as he should have in the playoffs, he's still had decent averages, still made an impact. In the games that the Kings won, he was really solid in, in the majority of those games too. So my my where I'm not concerned about the future of Sab DeMontis Sabonis is the areas that he has to improve on, I'm not going to say are simple, 
but they're very, I guess, approachable. It's not like a daunting task to imagine him suddenly becoming more comfortable hitting that mid-range jumper. Because if teams are going to back off of him the way the Warriors did consistently over the course of an 82-game season, Sabonis is going to take advantage of that more often than not, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. And I also feel like Kevin Herter struggles because him and Sabonis, their success kind of depended mm-hmm. on each other. Kevin Herter's struggles um, also ma- kind of made Sabonis look bad Mm. and if Herter was knocking down those shots you know they both would have had more success I think and not that conversation around Sabonis wouldn't have been so negative but again like you said the things that he needs to work on aren't crazy things I think just that mid-range jumper easy fix you know get in the gym not okay not simple but you know it's it's fixable even if it's a slight improvement they took the defending champions to game seven Mm. if Sabonis would have just been able to knock that shot down a little bit who knows what would have happened? So I think, like you said, it's it's not something that's impossible to overcome for Sabonis. And I definitely have no doubt in my mind that it's something that's been an emphasis for him all summer. On the flip side, is there anything that happened in the playoff series that you're you're thinking, like, I'm not concerned about that at all? Like, this is something, like, for example, like De'Aaron Fox, his, his dip in production after hurting his hand. We saw how good he was. He had one of the best playoff debuts uh, ever in terms of the offensive output. And then he hurt his hand and didn't look like himself. So it's like when, if De'Aaron is healthy and gets back into that spot, I have no concerns at all that De'Aaron Fox is going to still be that guy and maybe even capable of taking it to another level. Is there anything about that playoff series that you look at? And maybe it's the first three games of Keegan Murray and go, you know what? They're past that. I'm not concerned about that. Well, I think what's funny about this series is that both teams, shooters and leading scorers, didn't really perform. For the Warriors, uh, anyone not named Steph Curry, Clay struggled, JP struggled, Jordan Poole struggled. And then for the Kings, it was Herter and Keegan in those first couple games struggling. Those uh, Kevin Herter was, what, their third top scorer during the regular season last season, and he just didn't show up. So I'm not concerned that um that herder or keegan will have those struggles again we've seen like i said we've seen herder he he's capable of performing under the you know the bright lights of the playoffs he did it with the hawks mm-hmm. um against the 76ers a while back and um he's he had those clutch games last season even in the regular season um like a couple i think you know game winners that three point that three point game winner against the jazz um i was there actually watching as a fan so i was able to scream which was amazing um but yeah i'm not concerned about it but i do think you know let's say they do play the warriors again or um you know someone else just like the kings need to be making adjustments and the shooters will be working on their shot other teams will as well um so i think you know it definitely needs to be a point of emphasis for Herder especially, um, and and Keegan and even Harrison Barnes. Um, but I'm not concerned about that at all. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Ibotta. And with summertime being in full swing here in Sacramento, we're back in triple, triple digits this weekend. So maybe you've upgraded your wardrobe a little bit to help you get through that summer heat. But sooner or later, you got to start thinking about fall clothing. And whenever you're purchasing your clothing, wherever you're shopping, Make sure you're using Ibotta because you can earn cash back on any single purchase, whether it's stuff for uh, for your wardrobe, whether it's stuff for your pantry, your groceries, whatever it may be. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of different items and you can link your royalty account or just upload your receipt and start earning cash back right away. It's truly that simple. The average Ibotta user earns $120 a year. That could help cover the cost of one big shopping spree, help you towards vacation. Hey, maybe use that to buy yourself some Sacramento Kings tickets this upcoming season. Other apps will give you uh, like royalty points towards their brands or specific things in their store, not Ibotta. You get cash that you can spend on whatever you want. And even online retailers uh, work with Ibotta, including Lowe's or Best Buy. Uh, Macy's or Sephora. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 for just trying Ibotta and using the promo code LOCKED when you uh, sign up and register. Go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the free Ibotta app and use code LOCKED. That's I-B-O-T-T-A at the Google Play or App Store and use promo code LOCKED. 
You're like me, Tristy. We we watch these games and we get invested in these games, but we're in the media section. So something happens, we clench our fists under the table or our jaw gets a little bit tighter because we have to contain it and hold it in. But I mean, the 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 magic and the the volume, just of that moment alone, too, the pop, and I think that translated through TV too of Kevin Herter's game winner against the Utah Jazz, nearly breaking microphones inside the arena. So I, I'm looking forward to more moments like that this next season. But speaking of Kevin Herter, Tristy. And, and maybe you can include Harrison Barnes in this conversation too. Like full expectation for me is that the starting lineup is going to be the exact same. I'm interested to see what lineups look like in training camp in terms of who Mike Brown tries to pair with each other, because we know he likes to stagger his lineups a lot uh, with his rotations. But I expect the starting five to be the exact same for pretty much the entire season, unless the Kings make a move at the trade deadline. But if there's anybody that's going to make a bid for stepping into the starting lineup, it's Malik Monk for how well he played. Do you feel the same way? Do you think Malik Monk should be taken under consideration as a starter, or do you think he's perfect in his role? Absolutely. Um, I think it, it can go both ways. I think if Herter, you know, proves in training camp and early practices and even early in the season that, um, you know, he's capable of contributing in the first unit and Malik having that spark off the bench, I think is huge for the Kings um, because, you know, even if they go down or whatever, if they're up, Malik coming off the bench just provides that energy and it's so much fun to watch. And um, so I don't think, I don't think that um, I, I think Kevin Herter though, I will say has um, knows that if he does not perform well, Mike Brown has, will not hesitate to pull him out, especially after the postseason that he had, you know, even during the postseason, we did hear Mike Brown all throughout the series say, I keep telling him, keep shooting, keep shooting. If he's open, keep shooting. He has Mike Brown has tons of confidence in Keegan and shooter and the shooters and, and Herder. But if they're not holding up their end of the bargain, then Mike Brown will not hesitate to pull them out. And I think Herder knows that entering this year. And I think if he doesn't perform to what we've seen that he's capable of performing in the past, then I think Mike Brown should consider putting Malik into that spot. Kevin Herter's shooting struggles are very traceable. And what I mean by that is, I mean, you just look at as the season goes on. I mean, he, he shot 53% from three-point range in October. He started red hot. I think nobody expected that to continue. 41% in November, 37% in December and January. Then in February, he plummeted to 29%. Has the all-star break, comes out of it in March, shoots 51% from three-point range. And then in April in the playoffs, shoots like around the 25% mark. So you can clearly see a tie to fatigue and games played and, and the amount of uh, time without rest having a clear effect on the shooting of Kevin Herter. I don't know, Tristy, if that's a good thing or not. I don't know if that's concerning or not because it's easy to say, oh, it, you can see what the, the the concern is, but also it's an 82-game season. You know that you're a, you're a, a top guy that's going to be getting a, a lot of minutes as a starter in Sacramento. So we would expect Kevin Herter to be able to overcome that and maybe pace himself a little bit better. Are you are you more concerned or less concerned by the the revelations of those shooting numbers? I think everything's is kind of just like a learning experience. You know, it was his first season with the Kings, and maybe he wasn't used to the type of offense that Mike Brown or that the Kings ran, which is really really you know fast paced, mm -hmm. a lot of screening and lots of running running around instead of just you know catching and shooting. Um, so I think with the full off season now with, you know, under his belt after the first, his first season with the Kings, I think he knows a little bit more of what to expect. Hopefully he can, um, condition a little bit more because his shot is there. His shot is pure. His shot is pretty. Um, but you know, I think he knows what he needs to focus on. And like I said, if he doesn't, then I think, you know, there's other guys on the bench that are willing to take his spot. What did you make of the uh, the two California Classic performances from Keegan Murray? Amazing. Um, you know, I know it's summer league and people, Twitter was like, why is Keegan Murray playing? Um, I personally thought it was great for him. I think, um, you know, having those reps and continuing to play, he's a young player. He showed obviously that he is talented and, you know, um, is fully capable of having those types of performances. And I think he looked a lot more confident, you know, um, carrying the ball and um, he didn't have that much of that type of role last season with De'Aaron, you know, mostly with the ball and Sabonis. But I think it gave a glimpse of kind of maybe what the Kings are expecting of him entering year two, which we know they have these high expectations for him. We keep hearing, you know, Monty McNair saying he needs to make a sophomore leap. 
Um, so I think that summer league was a preview of, you know, what's to come from Keegan. Are your expectations tied with the uh, with the Kings front office in the sense that if the Kings are going to continue to develop and make that next leap into becoming a legitimate contending team, that it's going to be kind of Keegan Murray that makes the most noticeable jump out of anybody on the group? I mean, yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think Keegan, you know, is that is the person that needs to make the biggest spark. But again, this is a team sport, so it, it needs to be coming from everybody. Um, I think Davion also needs to make some type of leap because we know what he does on the defensive side. And um, like I said, you know, he's been working on a shot all summer. So I'm excited to see what, you know, he brings on the offensive side this year. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I yeah, I think um, Davion and like Keegan, I think um, they'll bring it this year. What do you make of, or, or what have your just your general thoughts been on the the off season that Monty McNair and the Kings have had? They're essentially running it back. They've added a few uh, additions uh, on the perimeter, some maybe big additions in Sasha Vezinkov and Chris Duarte, along with the rookies that they've drafted. But overall, this team is pretty much running it back next year. What do you think about the off season they've had? I really like what you know what they did. I think it's fans can get a little bit crazy with the off season, like. Mm you know, the, the West, they're saying, you know, Kevin, Kevin Durant and, you know, the Lakers had a really great off season and what are we doing? Oh, like we're resigning Harrison Barnes. And I understand, I understand. I, I was with Kings fans in the beginning with the Harrison Barnes um, extension, but I think looking back at all, all the other um, contracts and the massive lucrative contracts, this was the right move. I think they, and it's not necessarily running it back. Um, I feel like this is a new team um, with just some of the same guys that worked for the Kings last season. And, you know, they have several great additions. Uh, we don't know. We, we haven't seen it uh, actually on the hardwood. We, we, we see it on paper, what it could be. But I think it's great. And I'm excited to, like everybody else, I'm excited to see Sasha. Um, I think that the NBA world doesn't really know what's in store um, for Sasha. I mean, that's fair to say. Nobody does. But I think, you know, the league should not sleep on him. And I'm excited to see how he fits into the rotation. I understand fans concern when it comes to the Kings haven't really addressed their defensive issues. They've brought in some like Chris Duarte, for example, he has some defense to his game. And I think it's fair to expect from the entire roster, better defensive production as a team. Not necessarily. I mean, we know the Kings have some decent individual defenders. Davion Mitchell's the first guy that we look at, but the Kings are only going to grow defensively if they become a, a like a halfway decent, just bang average, if you can continue to be offensively what you are and then become a league average defense as a team, then the Sacramento Kings, I think, are in a, in a good position to succeed. But fans are concerned that they haven't done enough to really get them there. What are your, what's your like panic meter at or at all on the Kings defense going into next year? Um, honestly, I'm right there with Kings fans. I don't think that um, the Kings did much to address their defensive struggles. Um, but you can only hope that with a coach like Mike Brown, who, you know, has that defensive mindset that at the very least they improve just a little bit, you know, every player, but it comes down to every single player making that, um, commitment to on defense. But honestly, like, I feel like this team is just locked in on offense. Like they're just going to be another really great offensive team. Of course, we know you need to play defense to win games and, win playoff series. Um, we even saw that in their loss to the Warriors. But I think, you know, if even adding a guy like Nerland Noel, if they keep him like protecting the rim, hopefully that's, you know, that's something that we weren't, the Kings weren't able to do last series or really much in um, the regular season last year. So little things like that, I think little contributions on the defensive end from each player um, will make all the difference. Going back to the Warriors series, though, defensively, their their metrics were significantly better than at any point during the regular season. And a lot of people, myself included, attribute a lot of that to the physicality of, of postseason basketball. Refs let a little more go. There's less kind of ticky-tack touch fouls that the Kings were. People for, like it, it feels like forever ago, but early on last season, Trista, you remember this, the whistle was not the Kings' friend. Like, And Mike Brown had to speak about it openly uh, to the media multiple times, and I'm surprised was never really fined for it. So do you think think the Kings figured something out defensively or do you think it was more the refs letting more go a combination of both where were you at with that I think fans will always complain about the refs to be honest yep. <laughs> um myself I'm very guilty of that <laughs> um but I think that 
I liked it. I liked the the defensive, um, the intensity of the series, the the series against the Warriors. I think that you know entering entering the playoff series, it was like the Warriors, the you know four time champions in the last eight seasons against the little puny little Kings. Like so, if at the very least the Kings could bring is the intensity on the defensive end, and I thought they did that. And I think Mike Brown kind of made that an emphasis for them entering the series. And I think. They, they held up their end of the bargain. I think it was really intense. I mean, the whole Draymond Sabonis thing, you know, lots of Looney and um, Domas going at it in the paint. Like, I think that was great. And as a basketball fan, that's the type of series and, you know, playoff match, matchups that I like to see. Even though the Kings lost the series, I thought they came out of that showing, hey, we've arrived. And I think I thought the rest of the league and from a national standpoint was going, okay, this Kings team is good. I think it was arguably the best playoff series out of any uh, last season, but here we are coming into this season, Tristy and the early power rankings are out and the Sacramento Kings are 12th, but there's seven other teams in the, or rather six other teams in the West ahead of them, including every single team in the Pacific division that the Kings just won the Pacific division last year. So again, the Kings are getting slept on a little bit and I know they have to prove it. I know they have to show that last year wasn't necessarily a, a, a fluke. And I'm very confident that they will do that, but are the Kings already being disrespected a little bit? And where do you expect the Kings to fall? When, I mean, I know it's early predictions and a lot can happen, but where do you expect the Kings to end up in terms of like seeding and what kind of tier they're going to be in? Yeah. I mean, I think like you said, they have to uh, prove it again. They, you know, it, it was a Cinderella story. It was the, you know, snapping the playoff um, drought, but I think, and I think they, they will do that again this season, but they do have to prove it. So it's, almost fair but um I think it is I think it is disrespectful um I think that um but but I truly think De'Aaron Malik like they like to hear things like that Mm -hmm. because you know keep doubting us and we'll continue to prove you wrong they were even after you know they had that hot stretch in the beginning it was like okay it's you know it's early no one's really no one paid attention then you know they continued to do well and it was still like no no we don't believe you no like even in the playoff series. Oh, it's the Warriors. No, like they continuously were doubted and they continue to prove people wrong. And I don't see that changing entering the next season. Um, as far as my expectations seating wise for them, do I think they'll be the number three seed again? It's really hard to say the West is so wild and wacky and weird. Um, I think injuries will play, you know, a, a factor in not just the King season, but the whole West and the whole league. Um, I think, I do think Denver is still like my favorite. Um, and then I don't know, like Phoenix second, but also injury, maybe in the Kings, I can throw like five teams in that can be number three. Mm -hmm. Um, and that comes down again to like health and LeBron and Paul George and Kawhi and who knows, you know, Mm -hmm. there's, I think on paper, there are teams better than the Kings that could take that third seed, but also, I don't see that being impossible for the Kings to accomplish again this year. Well, we're in the driest, deadest part of the off season. We're going to get through it together. And Tristy, of course, when training camp starts and when we get closer to that in preseason, we now know the preseason schedule and everything. Of course, you're going to be all over coverage over there on uh, NBC sports. Uh, Share a little bit about like what it is that you have coming, what it is that, that, fans kings fans can expect uh to help us all get through this uh this this offseason that's been extended a little bit i hate that the last preseason game is on the same day last year that the regular season started i don't know why they're doing this to us but we'll make it through to the end of october kings basketball will return what are you doing until then yeah we actually um just had like a meeting i think last week or the week before and kind of broke down all right you know this is our plan um to roll out stories get content out so there will be a lot of great things coming out from NBC sports california from myself and tom and you know the rest of our staff um but we're really just trying to um after such an amazing season we're trying to keep things rolling and be all on top of things kings because like i said we share an office you know covering the warriors and we we, we try to do our best you know Um, make the most out of what our coverage with the Kings. So I'm really excited. And I know the preseason game, the final preseason game is right before my birthday. So I'm kind of excited that I think like one of the first um, regular season games might be on my birthday. So at least that's cool. (laughs) 
an even extra layer to celebrate. Well, Tristy, it's been a, it's been a pleasure getting to know you last year. I'm looking forward to covering Kings basketball again with you this year. Uh, and this won't be the uh, the 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 first and only time that you're uh, on Locked On Kings. If I can steal your time over the course of the regular season, I'll do that. But I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you for coming on. You're amazing, and uh, let's do it again soon. Please do. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Big thank you to Tristy for joining me here on the Locked On Kings podcast. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Looking forward to having her back on it again. Check out the great content that she, Tom, and the rest of the NBC Sports crew uh, is putting out, especially as we get closer and closer to training camp. Uh, that's going to really roll out, and uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff to read about and follow. Tristy has a, a great perspective, uh, and I look forward to having that perspective back here on the podcast in the near future. Of course, we want to hear your perspective, too. So your thoughts uh, on the, uh, the concerns, or if you have any concerns based off of what happened in the playoffs last year, if you expect those to be solved or those to be maybe rearing their ugly head from time to time during the regular season. Uh, let me know how you're feeling about that. You can respond at Matt George Sack on Twitter, or X, I guess is it's called now. You can email me, mattgeorgesports at gmail.com. And if, of course, you're watching on YouTube, leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. We're one week closer now to the start of the regular season. We're in August. We're in the thick of it. It's rough. We'll get through it. Uh, and I appreciate you uh, lending your support and your patience here to the Locked on Kings podcast during this time. Kings basketball will here, be here before you know it. So be patient. We'll get through it together. I appreciate your support as always. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of the Locked on Kings podcast. Until then, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.